Coming to the end of the third quarter. LeBron James, a shot in history. This shouldn't be possible. This record was never meant to be broken, and yet, it was. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was instantly the best player in the league from the moment he was drafted. Due to a rule change in college that removed dunking, a rule that was targeted specifically at Kareem, Lou Alcindor at the time, Kareem would develop a shot later dubbed the Sky Hook. This was a nearly unblockable shot that allowed the seven-footer to score in droves. Over the first five seasons of his career, Kareem would average 30 points a night on 58% true shooting, which was 8% better than the league average. So you take that dominant scoring the ball thanks to an unstoppable shot, and you combine it with the second most games played in NBA history, and you get an unbeatable record. 38,387. An absurd record that was never to be topped. But 5,251 days after Kareem would play his final game on October 20th, 29th, 2003, an 18-year-old kid from Akron, Ohio named LeBron James would make his debut versus the Sacramento Kings. And 12,292 days after that, LeBron would break that record. But how did this happen? How does a seemingly unbreakable record end up being broken? Well, in order to find that out, we're going to have to go back to that day in Sacramento in 2003 to see where it all began. The expectations LeBron had going into his debut were truly unprecedented, a level of hype that was never seen before and really never seen since. Coming out of high school, LeBron was touted as the best prospect basketball had ever seen, a big forward with off-the-charts athleticism combined with the skills of a guard. The league hadn't seen someone that big who could orchestrate an offense since Magic Johnson, and the league certainly hadn't seen someone who could do that with a 40 four inch vertical leap. In his debut in Sacramento, he would score his first bucket on a baseline mid-range jumper, his first two points with many more to come. His rookie season is the only one of LeBron's career where he was not a bona fide top 10 player in basketball, which you know, is fine. He was 18 years old right out of high school after all, and 21 points a game in 2004 placed him as the 13th highest per game scorer in the league. But it was his second year where LeBron would prove all of the hype to be well deserved. He would average 27 a game on much improved efficiency, and that 27 would be the mark that LeBron would get to consistently for the next 18 years. Unfortunately, LeBron's early greatness, while met with a ton of individual success, he would make All-NBA second team this season, and he probably would have been first team if this not being the era of the power forward, but success in the win column was not easy to come by. The Cavs would win 42 games, which tied them with the Nets for the eighth seed, but unfortunately New Jersey had won the season series. It's no secret that LeBron had some lackluster rosters around him, but this early on, you can at least give the Cavs some slack. They've only had LeBron for two years. At at least for now, we can give them slack. Not much longer though. By year three, LeBron would peak in terms of his per game scoring numbers, 31.4 points per game. He would have won the scoring title, but he had the misfortune of putting up these numbers the same season where Kobe was scoring 35 a game, along with Allen Iverson who put up 33 a game. This bump in numbers would see a further increase in those individual accolades. There was no denying him his first of many first team selections this year, but also it would affect the win column. The 
Cavs jumped up to 50 wins, and following this, a LeBron James-led team would win 50 or more games every year of his career besides for four. And among four of them was a lockout year where his team won 46 games and would have been on pace for 57 had there not been a lockout, so I would say that that does not count, and two of them were in the LA years. So until he was at the age of 34, he'd only known a less than 50 win season one time. And it's important to note that LeBron is only 21 years old going into the playoffs at this point. And just to put into perspective what LeBron has accomplished as a scorer to this point in his career, he was the youngest player to ever score 30, to ever score 40, and 50 in a game. The youngest to lead his team in scoring, and he's been the youngest to score 1,000, 2,000, 3, 4, and 5,000 points. And and the youngest to score 2,000 points in a season. So it's safe to say the signs of him being a record-breaking level scorer were there early on. All you need is the longevity, but we'll get there later. Now because of the regular season success LeBron had on the Cavs, this year it meant that LeBron would make his NBA playoff debut, matching up with Gilbert Arenas and the Washington Wizards. And in an insanely tight series where three of six games were decided by literally one point, LeBron James would not disappoint. Let's see how you're going to attack. Inside again. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, oh, what body control. LeBron would average just short of 36 points per night in this series. And in the first game of the series, which would be the first playoff game of his entire career, he put up a 32 point triple double. What I find particularly amusing about the outburst and scoring that LeBron would have earlier on in his years is that his game was just insanely simple. We'll talk about LeBron's evolution as a scorer because he certainly made big changes down the road, but early on, LeBron's speed, size, length, and leaping ability combined with his handle made stopping him going downhill damn near impossible, even with some of the best shot blockers in the world in the paint. His mid-range jumper and three ball both went in at a respectable enough rate, but his ability going downhill was inhuman. Slashing is LeBron's greatest skill as a scorer, and it was so unstoppable at this age that it did not matter that he really was not all that versatile in the scoring department. Second round, they would face the defending conference finals champion Pistons, who on paper were virtually identical to the 2004 championship roster, and they were actually 10 wins better than their previous two seasons. This wasn't a team you could play around with, and it would be LeBron's greatest challenge yet. Luckily, he would answer the call. While his point total of 27 a game was not nuts as his previous series was, I'd argue it was still quite impressive for a 21-year-old in his second playoff series playing against a top five defense with zero spacing and zero offensive help. LeBron broke the conventions of age early just as much as he would later on in his career. What made this series even more impressive from James was the lack of help he had along the way, something I'm sure I'm gonna be saying a few more times. And the regular season, LeBron's teammates would average 66 points per game. In this series, his teammates combined for 54 points a game, and unfortunately, LeBron could not make up for that 12-point swing. LeBron was averaging literally a third of his teammates' points in this series, and this lack of help in the point department would become even more egregious in Game 7. While LeBron would come to play and put up his series average, his teammates scored just 34 points in total, and as a result, they would lose the series. And what made it even worse after this is that LeBron had to watch his friend and fellow member of his draft class, Dwayne Wade, beat that very same Pistons team in the conference finals because he actually had teammates who could put the ball in the basket. Now next season, it would appear as though LeBron was actually taking a step back in the scoring department. His points per game dropped by four, though the Cavs did win the same amount of games. You could understandably be mistaken in thinking that LeBron was not going to bring that same level of intensity 
intensity to the playoffs this time around. And to be fair, that's just because he set the bar super high super early. However, this year's run would make last year's look like nothing, because the Cavs would now sweep the Wizards in round one, they would play the Nets in round two and win in six, and in the conference finals, they would face the team that eliminated them last year. And once again, the Pistons would not make life easy, and it even seemed as though they would have the upper hand towards the end of game five, with the series being tied 2-2 on Detroit's home floor, the odds of winning the series after losing this game would be hard to overcome. Leading by seven with three minutes remaining, things looked like they were going according to plan for Detroit. But then, LeBron James decided to turn this okay game that he was having to that point into arguably the best performance of his career, and certainly the best to that point. This was arguably the best game of LeBron's career, and through his scoring prowess, he managed to bring his team to the NBA Finals in his fourth year at just the age of 23. Unfortunately, however, the lack of offensive talent around him once again would be his undoing in the Finals, because an experienced Spurs team knew exactly what to do with LeBron. Given that no one else was a big threat, the Spurs queued up on LeBron and made him take jump shots rather than drive, and though James had shown signs of improving his jumper, it was still very much a work in progress, and this series proved that. The Spurs would sweep the Cavaliers in this series, but it was quite obvious that James would find himself back on the biggest stage. The only difference being, it would not be in a Cavaliers jersey, because his lack of offensive help, as well as LeBron's own lack of offensive versatility, continued to plague him. His teammates would not draw the attention of the defense, and that would make it easy for the D to solely focus on defending LeBron. What made this worse is that he had to watch fellow members of his draft class get much better supporting pieces. Dwayne Wade got Shaq, Melo got AI and Chauncey Billups, not to mention a handful of good role players, including Defensive Player of the Year Marcus Camby. And Chris Bosh got Andrea Bargnani. So yeah, he, it also sucked for him. But with the expectations LeBron had coming in the league, in spite of the obvious difference in talent that he had to work with, LeBron would begin to be scrutinized for his lack of team success. Hell, there became an entire industry just around hating on LeBron. Many people have made entire careers out of the practice. Now don't get me wrong, LeBron would still dominate on the floor and he'd really take his place at the mantle of best players in the league. And in 2009, he would make his best claim yet at the title of the very best. They get it to LeBron, Terry outside of a three, and two, LeBron to win the game! He does! He does! Screen, now Joseph, uh, Josh Smith matched up with him. Oh my God! The ball, Lewis gets it to LeBron for three for the win! Yes! LeBron James at the buzzer! In 2009, LeBron was at his peak athletically, one of the fastest players in the league, one of the highest leapers, and if you saw him coming down the lane, it was in your best interest to just get out of the way. LeBron had always been like this. Honestly, he still can be quite often, but the freight train mode that LeBron is known for was at its strongest this year, and that combined with his playmaking and defense would win him his first ever MVP award. But the same story would repeat itself. Strong individual accolades, but a loss in the playoffs every time. This year, the loss would come to the Dwight Howard-led Orlando Magic, which prevented us from seeing the Kobe Bryant versus LeBron James finals that pretty much everybody was rooting for. Same thing would be the case in 2010. LeBron would win back-to-back -back MVPs, but this time the Cavs lost in the second round to a stacked Boston Celtics squad. And leaving the court, it felt like LeBron was done with this situation. Done being expected to carry these teams on his own, he needed help. Let's rewind the clock a bit. The reason I keep mentioning 
mentioning LeBron's draft class is because they ended up playing a pretty key role in his career. See, back in 2007, fresh off of making the finals, it was time for LeBron to be extended. But unlike the typical 4 plus 1 deal that most players sign on their rookie max extensions, LeBron opted for a 3 plus 1, with the plus 1 being a player option, of course. This put more pressure on the Cavs that they promptly folded to. But what's interesting was Dwayne Wade in Miami had done the same thing, as did Chris Bosh in Toronto. So that meant that in the summer of 2010, all three players would become unrestricted free agents. And LeBron, having a bit of a decision in front of him, decided that he would make a bit of a show of it, broadcasting the decision across the world. The answer to the question everybody wants to know. LeBron, what's your decision? Um, in this fall, man, it's, it's very tough. Um, in this fall, I'm gonna take my talents to South Beach and uh, join the Miami Heat. Miami Heat. That was the conclusion you woke up with this morning. That was the conclusion I woke up with this morning. LeBron had decided to enter his villain arc, and by that I mean a 25-year-old made a business decision for himself and an entire city decided to treat him like human filth because of it. That's not to imply that only Cavs fans hated LeBron, however, because believe me, it was a lot more than just them. The combined forces of LeBron, Wade, and Bosh looked like it would steamroll the entire league. And given that possibility, LeBron was now the face of the decision to ruin parity in the league, and it seemed like that was going to be exactly the case at first. The Heat would win 58 games and they looked so good doing so that this statement from LeBron didn't even seem that crazy at the time. But we also know you three kings came down here to win championships. Not one, championships. Not two. LeBron, tell us about that. Not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven. It, uh... It was outlandish though, like quite a bit, especially considering what would go down in this year's playoffs. After losing the MVP to Derrick Rose, LeBron would lock him down and put up 26 on the other end on the way to a gentleman sweep in the conference finals. And the Heat would be matched up with the Dallas Mavericks, a rematch of the 2006 matchup where Wade would win his first ring, but with a dramatically different context on both sides, especially Miami. However, one through line for Dallas between those years was Dirk Nowitzki, who had playoff disappointment after playoff disappointment in his career. And he was determined to right the many wrongs wrongs of his past, and he would do that. However, what really stands out as it relates to LeBron is just how abysmally he played in this series. Dallas took the defensive game plan the Spurs had for LeBron in 07 and turned up the dial to a thousand, making LeBron a jump shooter once again. That was even if he was willing to shoot it. He would finish the series averaging 17.8 points per game, which was the fifth most in the series, being outscored by Wade, Dirk, Bosch, and Jason Terry. In game four, he put up a whopping eight points in a three point loss where the Heat could have gone up three to one. There was just no excuse for this. This would not be acceptable out of a standard star player, let alone somebody who was named the chosen one. In his first two final series, LeBron to this point has averaged 19.5 points on 48.4% true shooting. Just pitiful and not at all up to his standard. At this point, the noise was louder than it had ever been, and with that motivation behind him, LeBron would get to work in the offseason. It became clear that LeBron could not rely on barreling to the rim anytime he wanted to. Teams learned how to game plan for it in the playoffs, and his lack of outside options would consistently be his undoing. So in the offseason, LeBron would work with Hakeem Olajuwon on his post play and vastly improve his jump shot. And he came into the 20. 12 season with something to prove. He would win his third MVP, average 27 a game, and improve his percentages across the board, to the point that this was easily the most well-rounded LeBron had ever been. LeBron also dropped the villain shtick. He leaned into it super heavy as it first happened, but learned it wasn't the right way for him to play. He also fully established himself as the main guy on the Heat. He had issues taking the ball out of Wade's hand, being that the Heat were his franchise, but he came to understand that if this team was going to win, it was going to be with him very 
prominently at the forefront, not some poor attempt at a 1A, 1B situation. This was the lockout year that I previously mentioned, so they only won 46 games, but their win percentage was the same as last year, and it felt like this would be the year for the Heat. They wouldn't allow themselves to be blindsided or underestimate an opponent. They especially wouldn't just arrogantly assume they could beat a team because they were older and underdogs like the Mavericks. Wait a minute. Why are the Celtics up 3-2 right now? Pierce for three. And go! Paul Pierce from way downtown! And Boston leads by four! Oh. Oh boy. After last year versus Dallas, I don't know if LeBron's legacy would have survived a loss to Boston here. I mean, two years ago, LeBron was talking as though this was going to be easy. And now, two years later, and it's looking like he's going to fall short yet again. Game six was the most important game of his career. Never before had LeBron's legacy been more on the line. How would he respond? Penetration. Paul Pierce all series long. I'm in the guard LeBron James. James with the jump shot is good. Flash down low against Ray Allen. Turns, little jump hook won't go. James comes flying in. Got 36 points, 15 of 20 from the field. James for three, does it again. To top off that performance, LeBron would score 31 in game seven to close out the series and really close the chapter on the Celtics as a force in his career. Now his first finals would ultimately be the most boring. Out of the West came a team in Oklahoma City that was loaded with young talent. The upside of that roster was through the roof, so much so that even though they were all early into their careers, they managed to make it out of the Western Conference, beating the defending champions, the Lakers, and the Spurs in the process. They definitely weren't a team you could underestimate, but this time LeBron and the Heat would not play with their food, winning in five games, and LeBron would finally walk away with his first championship and finals MVP. And what else was there to say? besides it's about damn time it's about damn time LeBron had finally done what his doubters were saying he couldn't, and he'd freed himself from that pressure. And with his all-around scoring game coming even more into its own, LeBron was free to just hoop with no pressure, and with nothing holding him back anymore, we got to see what LeBron really looked like fully unleashed. Broken up and intercepted by LeBron James, the bounce for Wade, back to LeBron! There are three years that you could argue were the best seasons of LeBron's career, and this was one of them. And me personally, I think this was his best year. As a score, that would come later in 2019, as his jumper would really reach the level of straight up good. But in 2013, LeBron's jumper was hitting two just on a lower volume. It was actually the best percentage he's ever shot from three. And he was as unstoppable barreling to the lane as ever. In 2009, LeBron was at his athletic peak. In 2000. 2018, his scoring bag was as deep as it's ever been, but in 2013, well that was the happy medium of both. He was still as athletic as you'd ever seen him, but now with a post game, a mid range game, a pretty damn good three ball, and there was just nothing to be done at that point. And that was reflected in the 2013 playoffs. The Pacers put up a fight in the conference finals, and it was actually one of the more classic series of LeBron's career, but he himself scored with ease the whole way through despite having really good defense played on him. After this, he would have to face a force that he had seen before, but this time in an entirely different form. Tim Duncan and the Spurs were back. However, six years of not making the finals later, and this team was pretty old. Duncan was 36, Manu was 35, and pretty much Tony Parker was the only one who still had it like he used to. This meant that the Spurs relied more on their young players like Danny Green and Kawhi Leonard, and a system that heavily emphasized making the extra pass. This system, dubbed the beautiful game, allowed the Spurs to well outperform their talent level. As a result, even though the Heat were a much more talented roster, this was a fairly even matchup, and San Antonio's young players did come to play. Danny Green was a sniper, shooting 55% from three on seven attempts per game, and Kawhi contributed some noteworthy defensive possessions against LeBron. Now, outside of game one and a bit of game five, this series was actually off to a fairly boring start. Most games were blowouts for 
either team, with the Spurs now holding the 3-2 advantage going into Game 6. And it seemed like they would come out on top late in Game 6, as going into the fourth quarter, the Spurs had a double-digit advantage. However, LeBron decided to single-handedly mount the comeback. Because of course he did. This is their final period of the season. James to the basket and the finish. Six to shoot. Chalmers behind to James on the flush. James on the drive, leads in. Banks it in, tie game. Just fires a three, way off. Rebound tick, still loose. Picked up by Miller. Back out to James, another three. It's good. James knocks it down. However, unfortunately, you probably don't really know these clips all too well because history tends to forget the context of this comeback and it just gets boiled down to as simple as this. Ray's three sent the game into overtime, and LeBron would score or assist on every bucket in overtime, and his 16 in the fourth is the reason that game would be sent into OT in the first place. Not to take anything away from Ray Allen and possibly the greatest shot in NBA history, but some people like to use this shot from Ray to discredit the place this ring holds in LeBron's legacy, and that is ridiculous. Oh, and they won, by the way, in game seven, because the series didn't just magically end after Ray Allen shot. And, you know, LeBron did have a cool 37 piece in that game seven. But you know, Ray Allen saved his legacy, of course. This championship would unfortunately be the furthest we would see this big three go, however, because Wade's knee injuries would begin to catch up to him. And even though they would make the finals again in 2014, this same Spurs team would wipe the floor with the heat. And though he would overall have a good series, there were moments where eventual finals MVP of the series, Kawhi Leonard, really gave LeBron hell one-on-one, -on -one, something very few defenders could accomplish. Even when he he was shut down in the past, it was pretty much always a team effort, but Kawhi really gave him trouble. But after this loss with Dwayne Wade's injuries and age, LeBron realized that it was time for a change of scenery yet again. LeBron leaving the Cavaliers would ultimately be the best thing for them and LeBron. The down years while he was gone would allow the team to add both Kyrie Irving and in the same offseason they got LeBron, Andrew Wiggins, who was ironically drawing comparisons to James. Comparisons that turned out to be stupid, but they did exist at the time. He wouldn't be playing with LeBron, however, because in the same offseason, Kevin Love, the super talented offensive four of the Minnesota Timberwolves, became available, and he would end up in Cleveland in exchange for Wiggins. LeBron would once again have a star guard next to him and a star four who could stretch the floor. Now, it would take some time to develop the proper chemistry, and Love turned out to be a lot less valuable as the third guy in the pecking order, but a few deadline moves and some time to develop later, and the Cavaliers looked poised to make a finals run, especially with how weak the East had become, the Pacers had fallen apart, the Bulls no longer had MVP caliber Derrick Rose, KG and Pierce were now ancient and on the Brooklyn Nets, and really the only team that seemed like it could be a threat was the Atlanta Hawks, who were dubbed the Spurs of the East, but with no superstar talent, pretty much everyone believed the Cavs would run a hole through them, and that's exactly what would happen. But as easy as the East was, a new foe would appear in the Western Conference. A coaching change combined with David Lee being replaced by Draymond Green due to injury resulted in an explosion from the Golden State Warriors, and an evolution that ironically was started by the Heat really came into its own as the three-point era would begin, and unfortunately for LeBron, his star teammates would drop like flies in this series, and even more unfortunately, Charles Barkley was not right. A shooting team could indeed win championships because despite his best efforts, the Dubs would win in six. By this point in his career, LeBron was making a track record of getting revenge after losing. That was foreshadowing, by the way. With a full year and a training camp under their belt, the Cavaliers entered the 2016 season a lot stronger than their first year. And as was routine at this point, I almost feel like a broken record saying it, LeBron and the Cavs would dominate the East in the playoffs, and they would rematch with the 2016 Warriors. The same team as last year, except 
Not really, because after an MVP year, Stephen Curry somehow managed to make a massive leap as a player, posting possibly the greatest offensive season in NBA history. And that jump combined with the Warriors system being the most well-oiled machine in basketball and a notable leap from Clay and Draymond, it made them a freaking 73-win team. The Warriors were Goliath going into the series, but at least in this case, David finally had some help because both Kevin Love and Kyrie Irving would play this series in full, unlike last year. However, to open this series, Goliath was Goliathing, and they took a 3-1 to one lead as a result. Through the first four games, LeBron actually struggled quite a bit, averaging just 25 while also racking up six turnovers a night. Now, in case you hadn't heard, no team to this point in NBA history had ever come back from a 3-1 lead in the finals. It had happened a few times in the other rounds of the playoffs, but never at the biggest stage. But from here, what happened could simply only be described as greatness. <laughs> Oh, and I know I've been focusing on the scoring aspect of LeBron for this video. You've only seen scoring highlights at this point, but I cannot not include this clip. Thirteen years after being drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers, LeBron James finally managed to bring a championship to the land, and my lord did he choose to do it in a dramatic fashion. I really could not have written a better ending if I tried. To me personally, there is no single championship more important to a top 10 player in history. Maybe just for any player, period. This championship for me allowed me to finally appreciate the greatness of LeBron. Before this, I thought it was ridiculous for anyone to have of LeBron as the GOAT. But after this, I mean hell, he might be. Anyways, time for this guy to ruin the fun. KD joins the dubs. They cooked the Cavs in 2017, and Kyrie Irving subsequently demands a trade, ending up being moved for Isaiah Thomas, a move that would eventually derail both of their careers, just in very different ways. The 2018 Cavaliers, outside of LeBron James, were pretty god-awful, so because of that, the team decided to retool the roster quite significantly at the traded line. But even after some of those moves turned out to be genuinely positive, this was the first year since he was a Cavalier the first time nine years prior, where there was genuine doubt as to whether or not LeBron was going to make the finals. His seven year final streak looked like it might be coming to an end, but LeBron decided that he'd just go and have another all time great season, of course. And he took that momentum into the playoffs and that is putting it lightly. Seconds left. Cleveland triggers in. James, two seconds, one second for the win. Uh -huh. LeBron James delivers. Under three, three seconds three. to go. Throws up the floater. Oh, Good night, Cleveland. That is for you. Dribble shot clock winding down. LeBron and the Cavs had no right being in the finals this year, but at the age of 33, LeBron decided to put the team on his back like he never had before, which is saying a lot. 34 a game with a game winner versus the Pacers, a sweep against the number one seeded Raptors averaging 34 a game again, and hits yet another game winner. Things were supposed to be different this year for the Raptors, and I suppose they were, because this time around, the Raptors lost even more embarrassingly than normal. So. I I guess that is different. And 33 a game versus the Celtics with a 35, 15, and 9 game where he did not sit for a single minute to close out game 7. LeBron was in the finals yet again, however this would ultimately serve to add just one extra loss to his finals record, but not before an all time performance in game 1. Locker room, David West was following his teammate, James Bullock jump shot, that's 
good. Unfortunately for LeBron though, J.R. Smith apparently had one Henny too many and forgot what the score was, leading to a Warriors dub, and from that, the series was pretty much done. However, LeBron fought valiantly, and his efforts will be remained forever and appreciated forever, because he's the whole reason the 2018 playoffs didn't suck, so thank you for that. Like legitimately. But of course, with the roster being as bad as it was, LeBron decided he had achieved what he needed to in Cleveland, and now it was time to prioritize his own future and look at his career outside of basketball, especially as he got older. He would sign with the Los Angeles Lakers in a decision that many saw as LeBron basically entering a retirement home. He was to play out the remainder of his career in a sunny place with big business opportunities, and basketball really wouldn't be his focus anymore. But as it turns out, LeBron had made this deal with the Lakers with the promise of a big trade on the horizon. In a year where LeBron was carrying a team of prospects to the playoffs before getting injured and ending up missing them, for the first time in his career since 2005, mind you, this team would deliver on that promise, landing Anthony Davis in a trade package for said prospect, as well as a boatload of picks. AD would be one of the best teammates LeBron had ever had, if not the best, depending on who you ask. Me personally, I'd go for those first couple of years of Dwayne Wade, but... 2020 AD definitely has a case. This duo would instantly become the best in the league, and the Lakers would become one of the best teams in the league off of the back of a top three defense, and an offense that got by on its star power. The circumstances of the playoffs this year would be really weird because of this silly little thing called a global pandemic. That happening resulted in the NBA being shut down for seven months. This pause towards the end of the season, right before the team was poised to make a big run, threw a wrench in their chemistry, but that was not a challenge that every other team wasn't also facing. In the playoffs, they managed to avoid the Battle of LA that was hyped up so much that year, which in a way is good because having the Battle of LA in Florida would have been kind of lame. Instead, they faced the Rockets in round two and they beat them by leaving Russ open and letting him shoot them out of the series. Something they apparently didn't factor in when trading for him later. And they faced the Nuggets fresh off of beating the Clippers in a three to one comeback in round two. The Nuggets put up a respectable fight, but they were not ready for LeBron and AD and neither were the Miami Heat who had managed to make it to the finals after a six year absence thanks to a certain someone leaving. This was a surprise appearance for sure because the Heat were the five seed that year and no one really thought Jimmy Butler could do what it turns out he could do. The series would actually go to six games and make the Lakers sweat quite a bit, but the Miami Heat were hobbled and easily outmatched in the talent department. The Lakers would pull away in game six and LeBron would win his fourth ring and finals MVP at the age of 34, having averaged 30, 12, and nine in the series. Now, following this championship, we would enter a fairly dark period of LeBron's career, at least relative to his earlier success. After an injury-riddled year, the Lakers would lose in round one to the eventual conference champion Suns. They traded for Russell Westbrook, which would end up being a disaster. But ironically, in a way that parallels his early career, LeBron would then go back to putting up numbers on a not very good team. But he was doing this at the age of 37, 38, and now in the 20th season, season of his career, he's averaged 30 a game over the last two years, which is the first time he has cracked that number since he was 23 years old. To put that into perspective, the next highest scoring season in year 20 was Kobe's 17 a game in his last year. LeBron is averaging 13 more points than that, and to be respectful to Kobe Bryant, we're not going to talk about the efficiency difference. But that brings us to today. By this point, you've probably seen this clip a million times now, but here it is again. The end of the third quarter, LeBron James is shot in history. One thing that has always irked me around LeBron James is the notion that he is a pass first player. I respectfully disagree. Yes, even if he does say it himself. This is a pass-first player. 
This is one of the greatest scorers the NBA has ever seen, who also is an amazing playmaker. LeBron's passing is what sets him apart from a lot of all-time greats other than really just Magic Johnson. And that's deserving of all the praise that it gets. But taking it as far as to suggest that LeBron's first instinct is always to pass is just not even remotely true. Even with longevity, you do not score the most points in NBA history without being one of the most aggressive scorers there's ever been, and you don't do it without being one of the best scorers that there has ever been. LeBron is one of the most routinely snubbed players in the GOAT scorer conversation, and I guess you can chalk that up to his scoring game being simple, but when has that been a disqualifier before? Is Kareem not one of the greatest scorers ever because he relied on a few post moves and that was about it? Obviously not. Not to mention, LeBron's scoring became progressively more and more complex. I don't think LeBron gets enough credit for going from someone afraid to take threes to someone who launches over eight a game on respectable efficiency. His mid-range game became deadlier and deadlier as the years progressed. He has one of the best post fades the game has ever seen. His post game period is diverse and you pair all of that with being the greatest slasher the game has ever seen and you have a recipe for an amazing score. Such an amazing score that he broke that record in 150 less games than Kareem did. Nearly two full seasons of basketball less. So with all that said, congrats to LeBron James for this achievement. I felt it was appropriate to go to the very beginning to really put the insanity of his career in full perspective. LeBron could not have had higher expectations going into his career and somehow, some way, he managed to exceed those expectations. He immediately took his place in the history books, and he would continue to do it for 20 years with more to come. I ended the goatmentary with this line, and I'll use it again here. Appreciate greatness. There were times in my life where I hated LeBron James, like hardcore. But eventually you have to look at the bigger picture. And with someone like LeBron, if you are not taking in and appreciating his greatness while it is here, you are doing yourself a massive disservice. If you enjoyed this video, drop it a like, seriously, and subscribe to the channel because this video is just the beginning. There are some big changes coming around the corner.